Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to ch Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man that built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Would you pray with me, please? Come, Holy Spirit, and give me power to speak the words of your love that our hearts will be changed, that we will be made more like Jesus. Amen. I'm sure that you've all noticed that we live in a success-saturated society. The title of my message today is Success That Fails. Go in any bookstore, shelves are lined with books telling us how to succeed in whatever our endeavors are at the very highest level possible. Second place just doesn't fit in our thinking anymore. You've got to be number one. And uh, our whole culture is based on it. Why do we tell our children that they need to go to school and get an education? Well, so they'll be successful in life. Yet I wonder if we really have understood uh, what success looks like. Think about it. Now, for sure, most people in our culture have in mind the definition of success, the measure of which is money and the material things that money can buy. We are likely the most affluent society that has ever lived on the face of this earth. But I question whether or not our affluence uh, is really success. If it is, why is it that we have such problems with debt, crime, drugs, and suicide, even among our young, our youth? I mean, our whole culture seems to be like that businessman from Montgomery, Alabama, who confessed to his pastor, I've been very successful in business. I am a very wealthy man, but I have failed miserably at living. That's kind of my story. Our text this morning is a warning that appears at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the longest single discourse of Jesus that's recorded for us in Scripture. Jesus has been teaching on the standards of the kingdom of God, the way God's people are supposed to live. And Jesus is warning us about the very mistake we've made and that I made as judging life or success by the standards of this world rather than the standards of God's kingdom. You see, even if we manage to make and keep a lot of money in this life, all of us are going to come to the point that Paul spoke of in 1 Timothy 6 and 7. Anybody remember in your minds what that text is? For we brought nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. Amen. When we stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he asks us, what have you done with the life that I gave you? We will be empty and naked if we've counted on material things to be the measure of a successful life. To me, Jesus is explaining that there are really only two ways to look at life. First, there's God's way. There's God's view of things, which is outlined for us in Matthew 6. I'll read just a few verses uh, from Jesus. He said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But he's telling us very plainly that you have the right and the power, the ability to choose what it is that you treasure. Skip down to, to verse 31. He says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Then there's the world's view. Don't it? And the world's view of life is anything other than God's view. Ever how you want to do it. I call the world's view the ladder of success. And what I mean by that is the world puts before you a ladder. And each rung of that ladder is something you can own, you can purchase, you can, you can use to call success. And the world just tells you, you just climb up this ladder, accumulate all your stuff. And when you get to the top, that's where life will come together. Well, guess what? It's a lie. I climbed the ladder. When I got to the top, life didn't come together. They were just another ladder. And there's another one on top of that, and you just have to keep climbing. Jesus then warns us that from time to time, life will hand us problems that we cannot handle in our own strength. You hear me? Most of you are well aware of that. You've experienced it doesn't matter how rich you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how strong you are. If you live long enough, life will present you with problems you cannot deal with in your own strength. In other words, without exception, people need the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Psalm 127, 1. And that was my life. My testimony is not a story of failure, but of success. But I painly, painfully discovered it was success that failed. Thus the title of this sermon, Success That Failed. My early life, memory from my early life, starts in Jacksonville, Florida, where we lived there on the south end of Jacksonville, and, and I, my first experience with God was about age seven at Main Street Baptist Church. And one, we were there at night. It was an evening service. My dad worked shift work, and sometime in the morning he couldn't go to church. We'd go at night. And I'm sitting there, and this preacher, I, I don't remember the details of it, but I, I remember what I thought. He eloquently painted a beautiful picture in words of heaven and all the glories of heaven, man, and it was good. But then he just as eloquently laid out a picture of the horrors of hell. And basically the, what I understood him to say is, now when this sermon is over, the way you get to heaven is you come down to this altar and give your life to Jesus. And the way to go to hell is sit in your pew. So I decided right then, I, I want to go to heaven. I'm going down, I'm going to go down to that altar when they start singing. Well, they got started singing. He finished his sermon. They started singing, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood is shed for me. Then there's a real plea in the thing. It says, I come, I come. I said, All right, I'm going. Well, we got through the first verse, and I said, Lord, I'll go on the second verse. Well, we kept on singing. They got down to the third verse. I said, I'll go on the third verse. I'll go on the fourth. You know, there were six verses in the, in the Baptist hymnal. And I, at the close of them, I hadn't gone. I said, well, Lord, if they sing the last verse one more time, I'll go. We got there and sang the last verse. You know how some preachers do. He closed up his hymnal like this, stepped up front and lifted his hand to give the benediction. And I said, well, I guess I'm off the hook. It wasn't God calling me after all. <laughs> so then he started to give the benediction. He said, you know, I feel like there's somebody here that needs to get saved tonight. Let's sing that last verse one more time. 
So they started on the last verse one more time. And I said, well, Lord, if they sing it again, I'll go. And that went on. After they sang the last verse three times, I stepped out the altar and went down the front. One day when I was giving my testimony, it, it dawned on me to say this. They said, had I not come, I believe the skeletons of those poor people would still be standing there singing just as I am without one, one more time. Well, God got hold of me then, and, and, and my life changed. After that, I, I wanted to go to Sunday school and Baptist Training Union and did all the stuff. Well, then we moved, a, a year or two later, we moved to Valdosta, Georgia, and uh, set up life there. And we were just a very average, uh, middle-class family. Uh, and in middle school, I began drifting away from the things of God. It wasn't that I just rejected all that I knew it was just that the Jesus stuff was for little kids you know I'm getting to be a man now I was in sixth grade and uh, we wanted to do stuff that they said we're not supposed to do in in the Bible and uh, that continued on through high school I wandered for, further and further away and and college days I guess anybody had followed me they'd say well he just gone wild uh, but I mean I wasn't I wasn't an evil person in a sense. I went to college for three reasons. Football, parties, and girls. And I didn't even think about education until the year before I was going to graduate. I had to hustle to get my point average up so I could go to graduate school. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I did uh, meet a young lady there in school. We dated the last couple of years, and we got married. And in 1968 but while we were there in college I want you to know that Georgia was in the football doldrums I mean we hadn't won 10 games in three years that was three games two years and four games the fourth year we hadn't had a winning season in four years and Vince Dooley was named head coach of Georgia and he started in 1964 I was redshirted in 63 so I was a redshirt sophomore and uh, we expanded playtime there. We had offense and defense, and I was the starting uh, defensive end at Georgia for three years. And God, well, I say God, Vince Dooley, who was a godly man, he and his wife Barbara, and they began to raise up the athletic program at Georgia out of the doldrums and the mire and mediocrity. And we again began to challenge uh, for the championship. And, uh, and I got to... I was in the middle of that, so I got raised up with them. <laughs> I, I, I probably couldn't play today. Uh, of course, they didn't, they didn't offer me a scholarship back then. I had to, I walked on. But anyway, by uh, we got married in 68, and I finished law school in 71, and we set up our life here in uh, over in Athens, Georgia. And I had already climbed the ladder of success. And by 1978, I, I was at or near the top pretty much. I mean, I had a beautiful wife. I had two beautiful uh, daughters, one joining us here this morning, and uh, who had a nice home. We had many friends. My wife had a substantial inheritance, and I was doing very well in law school and business we entered into. Endeavors were, were flourishing. Everything was coming up roses. Anybody that knew me, you'd ask anybody that knew me, and they'd tell you, boy, that Jerry Marnado has really got it made. He's just got it made. But then came August the 29th, 1978. The storms of life that Jesus was talking about in our text began raging on me. The first was my do oldest daughter, Alden, who was eight years old at the time, was killed in a, died in an accident in her aunt's home. And I want you to know, through all that, I was still a successful man. But when I stood at that cemetery to bury my daughter, there was no help for the awful lostness I felt. There was no answer to the agonizing question, why did this have to happen to us? Uh, there were no answers. There was no relief for the awful pain in my heart. My success had failed me utterly and completely failed me. For the next two years, I was crippled. But I had some crutches. I had the 
remnant of my family, uh, particularly uh, Mari. She was with me every other weekend. I cannot begin to tell you the things God taught me through my daughter's simple faith in God. It just blew my mind, the things that she knew, because she didn't get it from me. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where she got it, but God began to teach me uh, through my, my own daughter. And, uh, but anyway, I, I was, the next two years, I had those crutches. The other crutch was a good friend, Don Terry, affectionately known as Big Don, because he was big. And uh, he, he was my very best friend in the world. Our houses backed up to one another, and there was a creek separating our property. And Don, had, he was a contractor. He sent a couple of men over and they built a bridge uh, over that creek so our families could get back and forth. So when you hear reference to the bridge, that's what it's a reference to. And uh, then came, oh, I wanted to tell you about the bridge. Don and I used to meet down there. And... Uh, we would just meet down there in the evening sometime and we'd talk after Alden's death. Most of the time we went down there, I cried. And he would grab me and hug me and tell me that God loved me. I didn't know at the time, Don was trying to witness to me, but he wasn't able to. He just couldn't get it out. About six or eight months before that, he had given his, his life to God, uh, had renewed his commitment to God. He was actually a charter member of St. James Church. But uh, anyway, uh, that bridge is where I would meet with Don. And I mean, it was his love and concern for me and Mars that really kept me going. And other friends that I began to meet, the, the Muneers were here, Jim, we were hunting together. Uh, but then the floods came. August the 29th, 1980, exactly two years to the day after Alden's death. My friend Don Terry died in his sleep. I was with Mari. Uh, we were out in Colorado uh, trout fishing with some friends. And I got the call and we had to end our eating and, and come home. I'll never forget driving back to, uh, to Denver to catch a, a plane. And I just couldn't stop crying. And Mari, bless her heart, she <laughs> was sitting there with a handkerchief and she'd drive wipe my eyes out so I could see the drive and say, Daddy, it's going to be all right. Well, I got to Don's house and went and visited with his widow and uh, Diana, who became a good friend. As a matter of fact, I'm using the Bible that she gave me after I first got saved uh, there on that bridge. I shouldn't say I got saved, I got renewed. I got saved when I was seven, but I was wandering in a, in a foreign land. Uh, but then later that day, after I left Diana's, and, and uh, or I guess before we went, went over there, uh, she told me that she'd gotten a lawyer. And uh, she was in the process of filing for divorce. And she wasn't about trying to be mean, telling me that at that time. But that thing, it was already in motion. She'd turned it over to the lawyer. And I don't know, the, the, you know, the sheriff could have showed up, served me papers any day, or somebody may have found out about it. And so she was a, didn't, want any, didn't want me to find out about it from somebody else. So uh, she had to tell me that, that night. Uh, but later, uh, so I, I was in, in pretty bad shape. Uh, all this time I claimed to be a Christian. If anyone had asked me, I would have told them that I believed that Jesus was the Savior of the world, that he was the Son of God, that his death on the cross was paid the penalty for all the sins of the world. I knew all that stuff, and I still believed it. But somehow, all the stuff that I knew, it never worked itself out in the way I was living. I, you know, my, all, my religion was pie in the sky stuff. You know, we just live on what you do, and when you die, you go to heaven. And I just never had worked it out. I didn't realize that sin had its consequences on the earth. Even though God might forgive you, you can still mess up and the sin will find you out. Now, uh, my life, you see, was not centered in God. My life was centered in myself. I was not God-centered. I was self-centered. 
And, uh, you know, I have learned in this life, for most people now, it's not universal, but for most people, if your life's not God-centered, it will be self-centered. And I believe, while there are many reasons that divorces occur, I'm convinced that self-centeredness is a major contributor. Well, my firstborn child and my best friend were dead. My marriage was over, and I was a broken man. Now, I wasn't suicidal, but I didn't really care if I lived or died. I really didn't. As a matter of fact, I would have probably just as soon died. If it hadn't been for Mark, I'd, I'd have just as soon died. But in the middle of my deepest despair, a merciful God intervened. The very night that Don, Don died that morning, that very night, I found myself on the same bridge with a man named Dr. Jim Kilgo. And Jim was a mutual friend who was an English professor at the university, and he taught Sunday school class at St. James Church that Don attended. There's a lot of other little side stories. I could show you the miracle of God, but it, how it, this all worked itself out. But if I did, we'd be here all afternoon. Uh, and we don't want to miss what's downstairs. <laughs> He was also a member of the same hunting and fishing club uh, as Don and me. We hunted together over in South Carolina, and he had become a good friend. And I'd asked him to come down to the bridge. He, he was at my house. I'd asked him to come down to the bridge. I wanted to talk to him. I got down there, and I said, Jim, how much pain must I endure before God will let me die? And he said, Jerry, God loves you, and he wants to to give you power to overcome this adversity and to live a life of joy in spite of it. And I looked at him, and I didn't know I had said this to him until I heard him giving my testimony to somebody else one time. He was a witness, and I just overheard him. What I said to him, Jim, if God wants whatever is left of my life, he can have it because I don't want it. He said, will you pray with me and surrender your life to God? And I said, yeah, I will. So we knelt down on that bridge, and I surrendered. And in the course of one minute it took to pray that prayer, everything changed. My perspective on everything radically changed. And I went from the pit of despair to the heights of joy unspeakable and full of glory in just a flash, a moment is all it took. And suddenly, without thinking it through, I didn't need answers anymore because I knew the one that holds death and hell in his hand. And he flooded my soul with comfort, with hope, and joy in the face of death. I'm, it was somewhat embarrassing at first. I mean, I, the next day I'm, I'm at Don's funeral at St. James Church, and I couldn't keep from smiling. I, I had heard his testimony then from others. I knew he was in heaven. I'll never forget Mari trying to comfort me, and she said, Dad, it's going to be okay. Now Alden's got a friend in heaven because she loved Big Don. Well, life since the bridge hasn't always been easy, but there's always been hope. I didn't realize how important hope was until I got through that time and looked over my shoulder. I found something in God's Word that I claimed for my own. Somebody told me to do that. and I found, I found actually four or five, but I finally, when I finally read this one, I, I kept it. It's Joel 2.25 said, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And I wasn't sure what that meant, quite frankly. And I didn't know how God was going to work all of that out. Uh, you know, the, uh, but it sure sounds good, doesn't it? Think about it. 
God will return the years the locusts have eaten. That's good. One of the most distressing facts of all of this was that I had lost my family. Now let me explain to you what I mean by that. I mean place and my people that I went home each day and I went home to that. You know, and I felt I was too old to start over because I was an ancient 36 when all of this happened. <laughs> Lord, did I know what God had in plan. Of course, I still had Mari, and as I said, she, God just taught me so much uh, through her. One of, I, can I tell another funny story? I don't mean to embarrass you, but this is really good. I bought this house over there right off Millage Avenue, and her room uh, opened, the door opened up into the dining room. And we were at the Bible bookstore over there. Uh, I can't remember, uh, can't remember the name of it now. But every time we went in there, she had to buy a poster of some kind. And this time she bought a poster. I believe it, this was one of the kittens. And this kitten had been up on top of this chest of drawers. And there was a thing of yarn up there, obviously getting ready to get the yarn. And didn't quite make it. And he was hanging on that thing with one claw stuck in the dresser, hanging. And the caption down says, uh, faith isn't faith until it's all you're counting on. <laughs> hanging by one claw, you know. <coughs> so she got in her room and she <coughs> put it on the door <coughs> from inside. But when you open the door into the living room, where it was most of you know, the time, there was that poster. And I said, well, honey, don't you want to put it in your room somewhere? I mean, if you put it on the door, you open it up and said, everybody can see it. And she said, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> what I missed was going home each day to my family. And uh, it was so bad, the first three months, that I was divorced, I lived with my law partner, Buck Griffin, and his wife, Gwen. They had had four daughters, and they were all gone. They had this big house, and I had a bedroom upstairs. And I tell you, I love living there, but I just, you know, after about three months, I said, I got to get out of these people's hair. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, little did I know the plans that God had made for me. In another part of the state lived a very beautiful woman who, like me, had strayed from God's ways and the devil had ripped her life apart. Uh, as me, she would be, had been formerly married. And she had returned to the Lord about the same time as me, and God had planted that same seed of hope in her. She told me one day I, that, that her, Joel 2.28, I will return the years the locusts have eaten, was what God had given her. Well, she had moved to Athens. Her company moved here. She worked for Belt, and uh, they opened a new store at the mall, and she was the opening buyer out at, at the mall. And she started attending St. James Church. There's another miracle about that, but I won't get into it. Uh, I was a member, and I, I knew she was there. She, I saw her in the choir. You couldn't miss her. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I didn't know who she was, and but anyway, I know that... Uh, Jane and Joy and some of the other ladies in the church knew who she was. They knew who I was, and they spent a lot of time conniving, trying to get us together. <laughs> Thank God for them. They did. They really did. And uh, so anyway, uh, we wound up going to Jane's house to eat, Chris, uh, eat uh, Sunday dinner after church one day. And finally, I got up and courage to ask her on a date. And... Uh, I'll tell you how dumb I am. On the first date, I took her to the door to her apartment, and she, we were just standing there. And I said, well, would, would you like to go out again? And she says, well, when? And I thought a minute, and I said, how about every day of your life from now on? First date. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe it didn't scare her off. <laughs> but apparently it, it did not. Uh, but as I said, she had returned to the Lord the same as I had and had that same, uh, same seed of hope in her heart. But, you know, as beautiful as she was and uh, 
it, that wasn't really what attracted me. What really got me attracted to her, I passed by, and uh, she was talking with some other ladies that were on the step. I believe it might have been a, a Wednesday night or something. But anyway, they were talking about Jesus. And I just butted in. You know, I just sat down and joined the conversation. <laughs> but it was Jesus in her that attracted me. Not that there wasn't plenty about her to be attracted, but that was the hook in me. I just was drawn to her. Well, we dated for a long time. Matter of fact, it was a, a long time, uh, six and a half years, I think. And finally, both of us were dealing with issues, previously married, that kind of thing. And it just took us a while to work through that. And when we both uh, felt the liberty to marry, we got married in 1988. And in 92, God blessed us with our son, Aaron, uh, who is here. And then the next year, in August of 93, sweet Bethany, who's also with us today. And, uh, and even th this was what got me. Mari uh, went off to Florida somewhere wasn't it, to go to school. And she didn't like it, so she moved back. She came to Athens. And for about two or three months, she lived with us because all the dorm rooms and everything were taken up, apartments too. And she lived with us. And, and one night, uh, we were sitting there at home watching TV. I was sitting on the sofa. TV's over here. I was sitting on the sofa here, and Aaron was here. And I think uh, Mari was sitting right here. And Beverly was in the rocker with baby uh, Bethany. And I looked over there and I saw him and I just started getting emotional. And I heard it, it, it was audible. In the back of my head, I heard these words. I told you I would return the years the locust have eaten. And he indeed had. But through all of this, God has taught me the true meaning of success. And what our problem is that we have confused success and significance. What we really want inside is to know that our life counts for something. And having money to do stuff with is one way we can have that sense. But, but trust me, monetary success doesn't necessarily mean your, your life is significant. Significance is God's definition of success. And anyone can have it. It's available to young and old, to rich and poor. It is withheld only from those who refuse the grace of God that's offered to us in Jesus Christ. True success is becoming the person that God created us to be. God has something in mind when he puts you on the planet. Amen. It's getting in, involved in the pursuits of the kingdom of God rather than being totally absorbed by our own pursuits. True success is fulfilling the purpose for which God gave us life. Do you know there is something eternal about every human being on this planet? There's something eternal and that will never be satisfied with just temporal material things. There is a hollow place in our heart made for God and you can't fill it up with anything but God. Money, power, success, uh, women, men, whatever. You can't, it won't fill it up. The only thing it'll fill it up is God himself. We were created to live in a relationship of love, trust, and obedience with God, which we can do through Jesus Christ. If that is our goal and we earnestly pursue it, we will enjoy true success. And with that comes peace, joy, Stability in life, and greater than all of those, hope. The hope of eternal life in the coming of God's kingdom. You cannot explain how important hope is. Matter of fact, I preach a sermon called Hope for the Hopeless. I might just do that next Sunday. I don't have time to preach it this morning. Hope is critically important. If you don't have hope, everything else in your heart and your life begins to die. If you don't have hope, 
So I encourage you today, build your house on the rock. The rock of a relationship with God built on love, trust, and obedience. Then let the rains come. Let the floods rise. Let the winds howl and beat against your house. No matter what happens, you will be able to stand because God, who never lost a battle, will stand by you. And on the last day, when the elements, including all of our stuff, melts in the heat of God's judgment, we will be able to stand and shout with all the heavenly host, Hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it.